very much. Exactly. So we all understand plastic. We use it every day. It's all around us. And so no wonder plastic has grown since the 1950s exponentially to over 330 million tons last year. Now the question is, is this good or is it bad? Well, if we look at the right-hand side of the slide, then it's definitely bad. So 40% of plastic at the end of its life ends up in landfills. 25% of it ends up in energy from waste. About 19% of it ends up uh, uh, creating uh, images that look like this. And this is just the stuff that we can see. And we have been listening about some of the stuff that we can't see, the micro and the nano type plastics in our ocean. About 12.2 million tons is the uh, uh, current figure of the people they believe goes into the oceans every year. And so clearly, that is unsustainable. And do you go to the ocean and bring it back out? Well, it, you know, it's great if you can, but look, the fundamental point is you've got to make sure that you actually do something better with it on land and stop it going to the ocean. By the time it's there, it takes a lot of energy to get it back out. And by the time it's microplastics and nanoplastics, then it's obviously very hard to do as well. And bear in mind that 94% of all plastic in the ocean is not on the surface. It's at very deep depths. And so um, we're only talking about 1% of it on the ocean surface, and that is bad enough. So get rid of plastic. We've lived before without it. So let's just ban it. And there's a huge school of thought which actually says, let's go and do that. Well, maybe not so much thought, because we have to think about this guy. And so we have to think about global warming. And we have to think about the rate at which actually our oceans are being affected by increasing temperatures because of carbon going into the environment. And paradoxically here, you can find that actually plastic could be one of our best friends when it comes to actually saving us from carbon in the environment. You know, 12.2 million tons of plastic going into the ocean, dreadful. 33.1 gigatons of carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere, already 410, 415 parts per million carbon dioxide, that's an existential threat. And so what we must not do is get rid of plastic and then create, exacerbate the carbon problem. And here's some numbers for you. A plastic bag and a paper bag. Now, if, gonna, if you don't need to use any materials at all, don't use anything. You know, I hate straws. I hate things on the top of the cups and, you know, stuff that turns up. And it's just trivial use of any resource. We should always push back on that. We should push back on that very substantively. And that's great. But if I do need something, bear in mind that there's 3.3 times as much carbon in a paper bag as there is in a plastic bag. The paper bag only becomes more advantageous to you if you litter it into the environment. And then the plastic bag, because of its actual longevity of life, it becomes a problem. There's 3.7 times as much carbon in a glass bottle in manufacture than in a plastic bottle. And, and not to say anything about the amount of uh, energy that the, you then use in transporting your product in a glass bottle um, that you don't have to do because of the plastic bottle is so much lighter. And so there are umpteen examples that you can show. You know, you know, let's not have plastic around our food. But when food waste goes up, there can be an order of magnitude difference between the carbon in the waste food than in the packaging which actually keeps it fresh. And so what we must have is a balanced understanding of this that we don't actually exacerbate the carbon problem by trying to solve the, 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 the plastic problem. And so I'm really pleased that McKinsey actually you've come up with this sort of uh, analysis. They think that by 2050, um, that most or, or more than 50% of plastic will be coming from recycled sources. So the top of the wedges here is mechanical recycling. That's what we all understand. You wash it and you flake it and then you, you use it again to make new products. You're not changing the form of the plastic. What I want to concentrate on a little bit more is the next two down, which is monomer recycling, but specifically feedstock recycling. And this is the concept where you take plastic and you take it back to the oil from whence it came, and that goes back to the petrochemical industry, and then they can use that to make more virgin quality plastic. Now, McKinsey has said, as you can see roughly on there, that those two things are in mechanical recycling, feedstock recycling, will account for maybe just over 50% of all plastic by 2050. Now, I don't often uh, take umbrage with McKinsey, but on this occasion, I think they're wrong, and I'm going to show you why. 
And so what does that actually mean for us in, in a day-to-day -day kind of basis? So, you know, you, we, the consumer, are, are over on this end, and uh, we, we take all our material gets collected and taken to a materials reclamation facility. You know, the guys from Veolia and Viridor and Biffa. And they sort out a lot of the cardboard and the paper, the metal and the glass. Today, they'll separate bottles. So they'll take the PET, we're hearing about that. They'll take the HDPE, the only two plastics which are largely recycled. Um, and then the rest will become uh, residual plastic waste, which will go for incineration. That's today. In the economy of the future, we see that going to plastic recycling facilities, which are actually able to take the stuff which can be mechanically recycled, and that then comes as washed color sorted flake back to the compounders who produce the pellets for the molders. And so you're back to retailers as product and you're back to the consumer. There's your mechanical recycling loop. The stuff that you can't mechanically recycle, so people talk about black plastics, and, and, and often that they can be recycled, but you just can't identify what they are. But when you talk about crisp packets and you start talking about laminate packages and you talk about long life type stuff where it has multi-layer materials, it becomes very, very difficult, if not impossible, to mechanically recycle that. That's the kind of material that, that, that typically is unrecyclable, which can now actually be turned into oil. That oil goes off in a tanker, you take it back to a port, you transfer it into a ship, and now you take it back to the refinery. And that's actually the, the, the step which has actually been missing, which, which allows these guys who know how to refine hydrocarbon materials. That's why they're called refineries. The point is, is that once the molecules that were theirs are now in a billion different locations, and they're all in our homes and in our hands, how do they get that back in any kind of volume that they can actually do something with? And they don't know how to take in solids. They don't know how to take in trucks into a refinery. They do know how to take in ships, and they do know how to take in oil. And so the role of the feedstock recycler is to make oil that can actually go back to the refining, go back to the start of the process, and therefore make virgin quality plastic from what was plastic. OK, so I so said, well, actually, this might not be correct. And here's why I think that, because that graph is assuming that you can't grow that sector of the marketplace any more quickly than this. Now, uh, in our company, what we thought was, well, ma plastic is mass-produced. How do you solve the problem of plastic? You mass-produce the solution. You don't bring plastic to a refinery or a refinery-type place to process it. Actually, let's mass-produce a machine, and let's take it back as close to this consumer as we can, back to the MRF, back into the waste industry, and give them the tools that they can take plastic, which they currently don't know any what to do with, other than landfill or burn, which is a disaster from a carbon perspective, by the way, um, and give them the tools so that they can take a liability material and turn it back into another revenue stream. We expect this machine to have a payback of less than three uh, years, so that actually this is something which actually can make money. Um, to do good in the world, I think that you always have to appeal to greed, unfortunately, so that things can scale very quickly. And so this is something that the waste industry do want and they can make money out of. And so that's why I think things will scale much, much more quickly. And so this is a pyrolysis uh, reactor. Um, you have a fluidized bed and you're pushing the plastic in. You're heating it in the absence of oxygen to about 500 degrees where the molecules actually thermally crack back to the oil that they originally came from. So you take polythene, and it may have 2,000 carbon atoms in a molecule, and all you're doing is fracturing it back, so you get back to maybe 15 or 20 carbon atoms, actually, in a, no a molecule which is now more reminiscent of oil. And so nothing in here is actually new stuff, in a sense. This is all just refined or, or, or oil, hydrocarbon kind of processing technology, being around for donkey's years. Some of you in the room might remember the days of coal being turned into town gas and the gas station. It's exactly one of those. We've just repackaged it into 20-foot shipping containers so that we can move them anywhere in the world. And, and here you can see two containers going out. Here's a pilot plant that we have in Swindenborough Council. You can kind of see the containers at the back here. This bit hasn't been put into a container yet, um, but it will be. And so we've just taken over this factory. The reason for showing you that is the ambition of this factory is to make 200 machines a year. And so if you think about that, that each machine takes 7,000 tons of plastic. So that's 1.4 million tons of new capacity that can come on stream every year. You know how much capacity we have in the UK right now? About 420,000 tons. 
to recycle plastic. We use five million tons. Why does it end up in the ocean? Because fundamentally, we don't have enough capacity to recycle it. Two thirds of what we call recycling in the UK means we sent it to Indonesia and we left them trying to do their best with it. And bless them, they don't have enough capacity to do anything with their own plastic, let alone our plastic. And so it's morally reprehensible that the first world countries are sending plastic out to, it used to be China, we may have all heard that the China said no, then Malaysia said no, so now we send it to Indonesia, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, places like that. Why does it get into the ocean? Because they don't know what to do with it, so they put it on the sides of rivers. And when the rains come down, it gets washed into the river, and the rivers take it out. But it's your plastic, and it's my plastic. We have the temerity to call it recycled because two-thirds of what we recycle in this country has been sent out there. Um, and actually what it is is plastic in the ocean. What we have to do is build capacity. If you can build 1.4 million tons of capacity each year, you think how quickly you could recycle all the plastic in the UK, in Europe. And this is just one factory. I have two factories. I have three factories. And that's why I think that actually this can scale much, much more quickly. But, you know, there's a, an, another wonderful part to this story as well. And, and, and of course, no system is actually, um, is, is, no system is actually uh, uh, without losses. So you have to make up the losses in a circular economy. So if you've got plastic that's actually going around and you use it as a consumer, it goes to the waste industry, you recycle it, it goes back to the polymer um, producer, and it comes back as a new product. But there are losses around the way. And so that donut of the, the inventory of plastic in the world, if you like, it needs topping up. But it also needs growing because plastic's gonna grow from 350 million tons to over a billion tons. I think that's great if it means we're using less glass, we're using less metal, we're using less paper, all of which have a much higher carbon footprint. And so how do we make it sustainable? You do the things that we've been talking about, but, but there's another piece to this. 80% of the stuff that you throw away in your rubbish is actually biomass. And so that biomass today can be turned into oil. People are turning it into jet fuel. And you think, well, that's crazy, because there was a tree, and it absorbed carbon dioxide out of a world that's got vast amounts of parts per million greater than we should have. And then you've used it for, uh, for, for paper, maybe, or it's been in foodstuffs, doesn't matter. And then we're going to burn it, put it back in the atmosphere. How smart is that? No, actually, let's turn that back into plastic. And so you can actually um, produce plastic identical to the plastics that we use today that have come from biomass. And so in a wonderful little way, the actual donut, if you like, of the inventory of plastic that's going around in the circular economy could even become a carbon sink. And so because of that, my view is, is that by 2050, instead of actually us actually gazing at our navels and saying what a dreadful material plastic is, We'll be using it much, much more um, th than we do today. We'll be using less glass, less paper, less, uh, le le less uh, metals uh, to reduce the carbon footprint and actually recycling probably more than 90% of all our plastics. And so therefore, my prediction is that by 2050, plastic will be the most recycled material on Earth. Thank you very much.